Okay, so this morning um, we are, Precious began us in the book of Joshua. If you have a Bible, why don't you open it up? Um, we're going to the text of Joshua chapter 2 today. And uh, it's, uh, it's been really good. Um, we actually have a reading plan. If you haven't uh, started with us uh, reading through the book of Joshua, uh, make sure you pick one up on your way out. If you, if you didn't uh, join us last week, you can always catch up online watching Precious's message from the week before. But Joshua chapter 2 is where we're going, and uh, we've entitled this uh, series Strong and Courageous because we are, we are learning what it means to follow Jesus and walk, walk by faith just as Joshua did and uh, how he learned to walk in obedience to what God called him to do. So Joshua chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 1 today. And... Um, and then, uh, yeah, we've got, a, we've got a few things that we gave you. We'll, we'll explain this in a little bit. Um, we are going to a familiar story um, in Joshua chapter 2 that I, that I think is going to really impact us in the way that we live this week and in the weeks to come. So Joshua 2, um, start in verse 1. If you have your Bibles, um, open it up there. And uh, let's, let's just read that together. It says, And Joshua, the son of of Nun sent two spies, two, two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. So to just catch us up a little bit on uh, how we got to this point, Precious kind of gave you a, bit, a little bit of a background on Joshua. Joshua was like, like you know, the right-hand guy to Moses, and uh, he spent a lot of time in the house of God and just, just in prayer, kind of, kind of underground, behind the scenes in preparation. And you'll remember that under the, under the leadership of Moses, he had led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and, and into, you know, into the desert to then go and take this promised land. Um, the land flowing with milk and honey, the, the land that had been promised to, to Abraham many, many generations before where God had promised Abraham that I'm going to give you this land and through you all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. God was, was fulfilling his promise, but, but the problem that we saw last week was that uh, these people did not walk by faith. They were not walking by faith in, in, in the way that God had called them to live. They, they come to this land 40 years before, and what did they do? The ten, sent ten spies into, twelve spies into the land, and uh, and and ten of them come back with a bad report. More on that in a little bit. But basically, they they failed to take the promised land by faith. And here we are now with Joshua under a new leader, and we find out that uh, he has sent not twelve, but two men into the land to go and spy it out to then go and take it. And so, so we may wonder right at the beginning here, as we read this verse 1, why in the world did Joshua not send 12 men again, but only sent two? That's a good question. Because, because, because this question, I think, has a lot to do with what Joshua was learning. I, I, I believe it's because in God's economy, sometimes less is more. Sometimes less is more. And we've, we've even, as a church, tried to sometimes do less for more impact. Less is sometimes more. You, you think about some, some concepts in Scripture like David and Goliath. It didn't take an army. It took a little boy with, with some, some smooth stones and, and a slingshot, and God used that man. You, you think about um, Gideon and the Midianites. If you're familiar with that story, he had, he had an army. I, I forget if it was like 10,000 and, and God whittled that army down to 300. Remember that? It was also that God could, could receive the glory, wasn't it? You think about uh, how Jesus even fed the 5,000. How much did it take? Five loaves, two fish. Sometimes in God's economy, less is more. And we see that right here. Joshua sent two spies into the land. And Joshua knew, if God be for me, who can be against me? We need to apply that into our own life, can't we, as well? The second question that we get into the text is that as we, as we look at, at the beginning of it, is, is the question, why Jericho? Why was the city of Jericho one that, that was first on the list to go and attack and to take by faith? 
And, um, and, and we don't honestly know the exact answer. We, we know that the Israelites were actually camped across the River Jordan, and Jericho was like the, like the gateway, the first city uh, of, of some of the other cities that were, were in the land. And it was almost like if, if you defeat Jericho, then, then you're going to obviously then be able to defeat them all. It was, it was like we need to get this one strategic victory in, and that was, that was Jericho. But beyond that, what we also see is that they didn't see someone that God saw. God saw someone in, in the city of Jericho that he wanted to redeem, he wanted to transform. And uh, that, is, that is what we're going to be looking at today as we look at the character of Rahab the prostitute. Okay, if you're, if you're with me in this, in this text, you'll, you'll see that, that there is a prostitute that these spies meet. And, and what happens to this prostitute is that she is transformed from the house of shame to the hall of fame, from the prostitution to being a princess, from the night to the light, from the house of horrors to the house of God. It's an amazing story that we're going to look at today, and so I, I hope you're ready for it. I've entitled this message, From the Red Light to the Red Rope, From the Red Light to the red rope. And I hope you know what I'm talking about this morning. The red light district is a place where the prostitutes are. And God used this prostitute in his kingdom to fulfill his purpose. Go with me and look at the rest of verse 1. And, and if you're taking notes um, this morning, uh, number one, one point that I want to give you is, first of all, I want to talk about her status. Her status is that she was a working prostitute. We see that in Joshua 2 verse 1. The second part of it, it says that these spies, they went and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they lodged there. Now, I don't think I would be preaching about a prostitute unless I saw this prostitute in, in some other places in Scripture. We, we wonder right away, what in the world was God thinking when, when he sends these spies into Jericho and, and what, they go to a house of a prostitute? This doesn't sound good. It sounds like they're trying to get something, aren't they? Yeah. It sounds like these guys aren't very spiritual, right? I mean, they, they go to the house of a prostitute. Were there, were there no other homes available on Airbnb in, in Jericho? No, I guess not, right? God strategically actually had them, had them go. You know, um, it's actually interesting when you study this that there are many commentators that actually try and sanitize Rahab. And, and they say, well, you know, it's possible that Rahab wasn't really a prostitute. Maybe she was an innkeeper, or maybe she just had a, a, a you know, a, a way station for travelers, and, and that could be partially true. She, she could have had an inn, but that inn was, was an inn for prostitution as well, and maybe not everybody wanted to do that. What we see actually in the New Testament is that when, when Rahab is talked about in Scripture, the, the Greek word pornea is actually used to describe her, and that's the word that we get pornography from today. And uh, that describes someone that is a harlot or, or a prostitute. So it's clear that Rahab is who they say in Scripture she is here in the Old Testament, that she is a prostitute. And, and I, you know, I, I, I look at that, and, and I kind of see, man, isn't that the whole point? Isn't that the whole point of this story? That God redeems unworthy sinners? That God uses people that are not worthy for his, his purposes? Um, that's you. And that's me. And it may not be prostitution for you, but you need to realize that those people that you would just write off and say, oh, they're, they're unredeemable, they're, they're too far from the grace of God, or maybe you're saying that to yourself, so I'm not, I'm not worthy of the grace of God. Well, you're right. You're right, you're not worthy, but he gave it to you by grace, by grace. And that's what we see through the life of, of Rahab. And I, I posed this question yesterday to just give you kind of a teaser of where we're going. I posted on Facebook yesterday, if God were to destroy the Ohio Valley and choose one person to survive, who would he choose? Who would he choose? Now, we may think, well, he, he would probably choose someone that, you know, that has a, you know, is, you know, pretty, pretty moral, 
maybe someone in, in politics or influential or charitable, maybe, maybe someone that's respectable or, or famous or, or spiritual. We may think those are the kind of people that God would probably decide to save. But you know, if we follow the story of Rahab, if we follow the story of Joshua chapter 2, what you're going to see is that God would actually choose to save that crack-addicted, prostitute-laden, drunken, you know, floundering down route to homeless person in our valley, wouldn't he? And we've seen these kind of people. Maybe you were this kind of person before. Maybe you've been into drugs. Maybe maybe you've struggled with that. Maybe maybe you lived a life that was pretty free. Maybe maybe you struggle with alcohol or, or some kind of substance right now. You know that God actually would save you? He would save you. If we follow this story, that is who God would choose to save. And our church needs to really understand this. God chooses those who are unworthy, unworthy of his grace. He chose Rahab. That was Rahab's status. Rahab's status. Second, let's look at her service. Look, at, look and read with me verses 2 through 7 right now. It says, And it was told the king of Jericho, Behold, the men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and had hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they were from, and and." And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. And I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. And by the way, as as you read this, all of this is a lie. And so God uses a lying prostitute to to bring glory to himself and and show his, his, his purposes here on this earth, right? I mean, how, how do we even understand that theologically? God uses a lying prostitute to, to bring him glory? What? Think, think about, think about what, what Rahab had just done. She had just lied. Isn't lying a sin? Yeah. Let, let's not excuse lying as not being a sin. Let's not go there, okay? It is a sin, okay? But the other thing that you need to realize is also lying is the ninth of the tenth, Ten Commandments, What is the first of the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. I'm not trying to excuse Rahab's lie, but she also was trying to follow, maybe maybe was trying in her her weak understanding, was trying to follow the first of the commandments, or she was trying to not fear man more than she feared God. See, she knew that these Israelites had come into the land to enact God's judgment over, over the city's sin. And so she, in an act of trying to protect these people that were messengers of God, um, she lied. She lied. You know, she feared God more than she feared man. And we look at, look at verse 6 with me. It says, says this, that she had brought them up to the roof and had hidden them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. You know, by Rahab hiding these spies, she was demonstrating that she had faith in their God. That was her status and her service. Third, let's look at her salvation. Let's keep on moving in the text. It says in verse 8, it says that before the men lay down, she came to them on the roof and said to them, I know your God has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came to Egypt and, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, who were devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard of it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God. 
in heavens above and on the earth beneath. Let's talk about for a second. Let's talk about her salvation. What did she just say? There, there are three, three main things that, that led, I think, to her salvation. And the beautiful thing is, if you don't know Jesus and, and you don't know if you're saved yet, you can actually follow these same steps too. First step was this. She heard about God. She heard about God. That's number one. It's been four decades and the people of Jericho are still talking about this group of Israelite slaves who their God had, had you know, delivered them from 400 years of slavery, had, had parted the waters of the Red Sea, allowed them to cross through, and then slam the waters of the Red Sea down on the army of the Egyptians. They defeated the most powerful nation in, 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 the, in, in the world at that point, and they were coming in their direction. And what did Rahab say? She said, when we heard that you were coming, our hearts sank, right? Our hearts melted. It says, basically, they all freaked out. They all were all freaking out. They were like, oh my goodness, God's people are coming for us, right? Now, does that, that, that at all line up with the way that Israel was thinking about what was happening? What happened when Moses sent the 12 spies into the land? Remember that? They came back with a bad report. Can I read a little bit of what, what they said? Their report was this. We can't attack these people. They said, they're stronger than we are. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same, th- same to them. Notice what they said. They said, we look like grasshoppers. We're puny. We're small, right? In our own eyes. In our own eyes. Think about that. Now, Joshua and Caleb, they came back with a different report. And they said this. They said, uh, they said we should go up and we should take possession of the land for we can surely do it. And they, were, they weren't thinking that they're anything big. They knew their God. They're like, let's walk in faith. Let's move forward in faith. And because of their proposition to just move forward in faith and trust God, the people actually took up stones and were about to stone them, okay? Somehow they escaped and they didn't die. That's, that's what was happening there. And the people were actually started complaining to Moses. Moses, why, didn't, why did you take us out into this desert that we might be killed? Let's go back to, let's go back to Egypt. Go back to slavery. What? Yeah. It's easy to knock on them, but, but the principle applies to us. You know, when we think we have big enemies, it's because we have a small God. Big enemies, small God. Little enemies, big God. We, just let me give, give you some examples. You may say, well, man, we've got, we've got big marriage problems. They're too big. We've got big marriage problems. What did Jesus say? With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You say, I've got big marriage problems. No, um, you've got a little God. You've got a little God. You may say, I've got, I've got big financial problems. Or I've got big addiction issues. Or I've got big sin struggles or relationship problems or health problems. Who's bigger? Those problems? Or your God? Will you be like those ten spies that returned from the land saying, we've got a little God? Or will you be like Joshua and Caleb that said, we got a big God, so let's go after these little enemies. Forty years later, we find out the truth that, that the, the, the people of Jericho and the Canaanites are mortally afraid. They're, they're freaking out. They come back with the opposite report. Let's trust God. Rahab heard about God. She had heard about this God. And second, she believed what she heard. She believed what she heard. It's one thing to hear. It's another thing to believe. She heard these reports about the God of Israel enough times to say, that is true, and I believe in that God. I believe he has done what they say that he has done. Look, look with me at verse 8. We covered this already, but just just notice a couple statements that Rahab makes. She said in verse 8, 
I know that the Lord has given you this land. He says that. She says that to, to these people. They're hiding under stocks and she's hidden them. And she's like, I know. I know. Why did she know? She knew that Yahweh, she, said, she uses the, the word Lord, L-O-R-D. Um, it's, it's often in caps in your Bibles. It's the covenant name of God, Yahweh. She says, this is, this, is the, this is the one true God. I know that the one true God has given you this land. She said this even before the walls of Jericho fell down. Think about that. The other thing she said, look at, look at uh, verse 11. She said, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. See, others heard, start freaking out, Rahab believed and put her faith in, in this God. You know, the, there was actually probably a pretty good chance that Rahab was not even born when the events 40 years before had happened. She was not even born when the reports came that, that the Israelites had, had uh, made their way out of Egypt from, from slavery, had crossed the Red Sea, that the Egyptian army had, had been destroyed, uh, or, or that the, the, the nations of, of uh, those two nations of Og and Sion had, had been uh, defeated. She probably wasn't even born, but yet she heard about it. She heard and she believed. And so for you, if, you, if you're considering Jesus today, if you've heard about him, have you believed in him? That's a good question for you right now. Have you just heard about Jesus? Maybe you're like Rahab and you're saying, you know, I, I've, I've heard enough. And I believe, I believe in this God. I believe that he is the one true God. Romans 10, 17, it says this. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Hearing through the word of Christ. What, what did Jesus say to Thomas? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet they believe. That was Rahab. That was Rahab. And blessed are you. Having not seen, you also believe. Have you heard about Jesus? And do you believe? So the first step of faith was to hear about God. The second step of faith was to believe in that God, in what she had heard. And the third step of faith was this, to then demonstrate, demonstrate what she believed. Demonstrate what she believed. Verse 12, um, this is a longer passage. So, so uh, read this with me in your Bibles. Starting at verse 12, it says, now then, this is, this is what um, the spies, or actually Rahab is, is continuing to talk to the spies. She says this, Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that I have dealt kindly with you. You also will, I, I have dealt kindly with you. You also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother and my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death, even if you do not tell this business, if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And she, and she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go to the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and, and hide, hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. And the men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear Behold, when we come to the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. If a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell us, if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Rahab, she demonstrated that she feared God. 
She demonstrated that she feared God by risking her life to hide the spies, by, by hanging a rope, and by helping her family. That's what we see her heart was. Rahab made a deal with these spies. She said, I've, I've hidden you. Now I need some protection as well. I believe that your God, the God of, God of Israel, is the true God and that he's coming to destroy the city. And so, so I don't want my family to perish. I don't want to, I don't want to perish. I, I have people that I care about that I don't want to die in this, in this battle. Please spare me and my family from death. And so the spies, they tell her what to do. And, and we think, oh, maybe, maybe they just were arbitrary and they just came up with something random. I'll just tie something in your window. No, I believe that there's something more than that there. I believe that what they, they, they tell Rahab to do is actually a picture that is actually weaved throughout all of the Bible. See, these spies, they say that the only way for you to be spared from God's judgment is by hanging this cord from your window. The scarlet cord that they used to come down from out of her, her house that was built into the wall. And so I, so I brought, it, brought something with me that maybe was something the way that, that it could have looked like back then. I brought with me a, a scarlet cord. And all that it is, it's just a, just a rope that maybe that they could have used to make their way down from the window of her house. But you know, as these spies actually told her, you need to hang this, do you think that it would have been kind of obvious with it hanging out? I would say so. Like a pretty obvious symbol, like there's something, something fishy here. And they said, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. And this was, this was probably another risk that, that Rahab took because we're like, well, clearly, maybe you let these spies escape. Well, yeah, she did. But they said, you keep this, keep this rope hanging as a symbol and as a sign of your protection. If you keep it hanging, it will cover your house. And it will cover all the family in your house as well. So you go tell all your family members and, and, and their family members to, to come into your house. And anyone, anyone under your roof is going to be protected when the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. But as I said, this symbol was, was not just something random. This is something that I actually, I believe, was also weaved throughout all of the Word of God. From Genesis chapter 3 all the way into the book of Revelation. We're not going to be able to, to weave through it all today, but, but just to give you a little, little idea of what happened, I want to take you just quickly back to, to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we know that, that Adam and Eve have sinned. They received the judgment of God. They realized that they were naked. And what God did is, is that he kills an innocent animal <coughs> to cover their sin, to provide clothing for them. And there in that picture of God killing an innocent animal, we see that blood was shed for an innocent. The blood of an innocent was shed for those that didn't deserve it, right? As we go on from there, we see that not only was blood shed for an innocent in the case of Adam and Eve, but we also see that, that in the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, that God actually had them, remember the 10th plague? What was that? The, 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 the death of the firstborn? He said there's going to be an angel of death that's going to come, come into the land. And, uh, and anyone that has the blood of a lamb on their do doorposts, that that angel will pass over their house. If you don't have the blood of this innocent lamb on, on the doorposts, then your firstborn son will be killed. And so it was an act of God's judgment. And so the Israelites, they, they, they killed, killed this innocent lamb and, and, uh, and they put the, the blood, as you can see, on, on the doorposts of their house. And that night, as the angel of death came, they were spared. Another scarlet cord, blood, the blood of an innocent, sh uh, blood of an innocent shed for those undeserving. You know, you, there, there's more instances through Scripture, but we obviously see it here in, here in Jericho. But we actually get, get to the point of where, where God gives the Israelites the law. And he says, he says, you go and you sacrifice. You sacrifice for me the blood of, blood of sheep and goats and, and doves. And, and you offer me sacrifices for your sin to cover your sin. It says in scripture, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Another illustration of this scarlet 
record all throughout the Bible. Up until the New Testament, when remember John the Baptist, he first sees Jesus coming from far away and he says this, look, the Lamb of God who comes and takes away the sins of the world. He says, look, there is the Lamb of God. There is the innocent Lamb of God. And Jesus went all the way to the cross. He shed his blood and then declared, it is finished. It is finished. You know, there, there's actually instances also where, where what, what, what Jesus was saying was that the, the work has been accomplished once for all. What Rahab was doing by, by hanging this rope from her window was symbolizing what Jesus was coming to do, was, was picturing what Jesus would do. As, as Rahab placed that symbol, she was looking forward to the ultimate redemption, the redemption that would be offered by an innocent to save the lives of many, to save all those who might take refuge in him. That's the picture of Rahab. And the picture of Rahab is, is also, man, the most undeserving in the city by faith, was saved. And that same offer is given to us as well, isn't it? So she hid the spies. She hung the rope. And she also helped her family. This is, this is another point that I see right here in the text, is that um, you notice that Rahab doesn't say, okay, good, as long as I'm going to be saved, I don't care. No, she doesn't do that. What's her first concern? It's for those that she loves. She says, she says save, save my family, my father's household. And, and the spies, they, they say, yeah, take them all into your house. Whoever's in your house, man, um, they'll be protected. Think about the concept in that. See, salvation is so valuable that once you discover it, you can't keep it to yourself. And that was Rahab. She couldn't keep it to herself. And so she, she went out into the city and found all, all those that she loved and she brought them into her home. And in a few weeks, we're going to actually preach this message where we're going to see the walls of Jericho fall down and what happened. But man, salvation was so valuable that she knew that if these people were not in her home, they were going to be destroyed. They were going to die because of the judgment of God. So she cared enough to go and tell them. Think about that concept just for, for you in your own life. Sometimes we think, oh, I practice my, my you know, I'm spiritual, you know, kind of just quietly. You know, it's, it's something that I do in private. You realize that, that there's people dying without knowing Jesus here in this valley and around the world today because you didn't share with them how to be saved? Think about that. Think about all the people in our valley that are going to die with no hope and without Jesus because we did not go and talk to them. We didn't care enough. Seriously, we didn't care enough. We didn't think it was reality enough to go and say, yeah, judgment is coming. Hell is imminent. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Without Jesus, without Jesus, there's no way to God. We, we, we have this verse on our back wall, don't we? Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But do we actually believe it enough to tell people about it? See, the reason why we gave you this bracelet here was actually because um, I think we need a visible reminder, don't we? You Notice this bracelet is red, which represents to us a rope. It's kind of, kind of woven into a rope. Can I challenge you with this? Can I challenge you to wear this? Wear the bracelet around if you get asked questions, especially if you're like a macho guy and wearing a red bracelet, and you're like, what's going on? Use it as an opportunity to share with them about Jesus. You can say, well, you know, I, I wear this because it reminds me that I'm unworthy of the grace of God. But yet Jesus, he saved me. He died on the cross for my sins so that I, I don't have to suffer the judgment of God and, and, and pay for it in hell. And, 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 and you can too. Jesus is the only way to God. Have, have you received him as your savior? It can open up a gospel conversation. It really could. 
And so I want to just challenge you with that. I also want you to wear it as a reminder to you that there are people around you that are going, going to be going to hell if you don't tell them about Jesus. Use, use it to remind you of the importance of the red rope, right? And, and use it to remind you that no one is too far from God. God saves someone like Rahab. So don't write people off. Don't write people off. Will you be like Rahab? Will you rescue those who are bound for destruction? Wear this. Wear this as a reminder of that. Number four. We're going to wrap up with this last point. I believe we see Rahab actually all throughout Scripture. Like I said at the beginning, if she was only here once, I probably wouldn't preach about her because it's kind of weird preaching about a prostitute. But she actually is found four times in the Bible. So let me, let me show, you, show you where that is. A funny thing happens, actually, when we get to the first chapter of the New Testament. We see that this writer starts listing generation after generation after generation, all in the lineage of Christ. And so he says, so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so. And, and this is, Matthew chapter 1 is, is, is a portion of scripture most of us would just like skip over. Can I encourage you that uh, some of the stuff that you skip is the place where God speaks? And right here, God speaks. He speaks through his word. So don't skip it. It says in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 1, it says, And Solomon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. You realize that in order to get to Jesus... You have to go through the prostitute Rahab that Jesus came from the lineage that she was redeemed into. See, God works through who he wants to. God works through who he wants to. So, so, so that's an encouragement to us. Stop being so stuck up. Stop writing people off. Stop thinking that, that people are organized into categories and, and some people get in, some people don't. Some people are worthy, some people are not. Like, like, like you're worthy? No. No, you're not. You ought to be glad that Rahab's name is written right there because it gives hope for you. And it gives hope for me. Shout it out by faith, by faith, by faith. God also shows us Rahab in the book of James. Um, actually, sorry, we'll, we'll go to the book of Hebrews first. In Hebrews chapter 11, we see Rahab. She's mentioned a second time in, in uh, the New Testament. And here is where we find all the Sunday school heroes. They're um, inducted into the hall of faith. These are all the people that, that we grew up learning about in Sunday school, like, like Noah and like Abraham and like Joseph and, and all these characters that are, that are amazing. It's, it's amazing some people that are highlighted and then some people that, that the writer says, oh, I didn't have time to talk about them, like, like David and, and some other people. I'm like, the guy that's after God's own heart, you didn't have time to talk to, but you had time to talk about Rahab? Yeah, he did. Check it out. Hebrews eleven twenty nine, 29, he says this, By faith the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. God says, I don't look at people based upon your standard. I don't. I don't look at people based upon your standard of significance. I look at your faith. And then James, he jumps in and he, he, he shows us Rahab's faith. Look at James here with me. James chapter 2, verse 5. He says, in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out? By another way? Notice James says, and in Hebrews says, Rahab the prostitute. Notice God didn't change her before he used her. You may be thinking, man, I, I've got lots of issues. And it doesn't excuse sin. But God did not decide to change her before he used her. See, the love of God 
is not the reward for change. It is the resource by which I am changed. It's the resource by which I am changed. So can I ask you, will you be like Rahab? Will you live by faith? I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, come on forward right now as we end. And um, something that I thought was really interesting, I was, I was listening to um, Stephen Furtick. He's a great, great preacher. And uh, he, was, he was preaching a message where he talked about his son just like thinking kind of out of the box. And he said, yeah, my son was with, with me the other day and he was, he was thinking, man, dad, what do you think it's like to be in heaven? You know, and, and he said, you know, they were just at Disney World and they were like, yeah, you know, in heaven, everyone's going to want to see Jesus, right? <laughs> everyone's going to want to get in line to, to talk to Jesus. But man, do you, do you ever think about how long the line's going to be? Right? I mean, think about all the billions or trillions, trillions of people that have ever lived trying to, trying to all talk to Jesus. You know, I, I know Jesus can be omnipresent and all that, you know, so we don't, whatever. But man, what if there's a line? What if we want to talk to some other people? You know, get in line, get someone to hold your spot, and then go talk to some of the other characters, right? Wouldn't that be cool? You know, there, there's some people that I'd love to talk, talk to, like, like Abraham. Like, man... How'd you do it? How'd you leave everything? You go walk by faith. How'd, how'd you do it when, when, when God told you to take your only son, Isaac, and, and, go and go and walk up for three days to a mountain where God said, go, go and offer him as a sacrifice? What? That doesn't make any sense. Why, how'd you do it? By faith, right? There's, there's people like, like uh, man, I would love to meet um, Joseph. All the, all the stuff that he went through. He's holding on to a promise of God. Wouldn't that be cool to meet him? That'd be awesome. I imagine there's going to be long lines for some people, short lines for others, right? You know, short lines for like, uh, I don't know, Jonah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, talk about a crazy prophet, man. He, God, God calls him to go preach a revival, and, and the revival comes, and, and then he goes and asks God to, to kill him. He want, he's suicidal, right? runs the other way from God. Messed up. Or, or like doubting Thomas. Like who's going to want to talk to him? Seriously. <laughs> but something interesting, so, so this is back to what, 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 what I got, was that he was like, there's actually a Jewish legend that says that Rahab could have been one of the most, four most beautiful women that ever lived. I, I don't know if that's true. Take it, take it for what it is. You can look it up. But what if you'd want to actually go and find out for yourself? Go and, go and meet Rahab yourself, right? That'd be kind of cool to talk to her. Imagine going up to, 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 to Peter and saying, um, hey, could I, could I go see um, Rahab the prostitute? <laughs> He's just like, Rahab the prostitute? And they're like, shh, shh quiet. <laughs> like, it sounds bad. It does, like it does, seriously does. Well, he starts flipping through his book and he realizes, um, you know, actually, um, we don't have a Rahab, the prostitute here. <laughs> See, we don't call people by what they were. We don't call people by what they did, or what they've done, or what they were labeled. Think about that. Up here, she doesn't go by that name because that's, that's not what we call people by. No, we call people by the name of what has been done for her. And so we don't call her Rahab the prostitute. No, we call her Rahab the righteous. We call her Rahab the righteous, don't we? Praise God. There is a righteousness that comes by faith. By faith that is from God. That is through Jesus Christ. It says in Scripture, for by grace have you been saved through faith, and it is not a work of your own. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Stand with me. Let's pray together. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Know this. Under the blood of Jesus, you are not what you have done. You are not what you did. You are not where you are. You are not what you were. Jesus says, I am who I say you are. And if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone. 
the new has come. And so as you bow your heads and you pray with me, let's just thank God for the work that he has done. Jesus, we thank you that like Rahab, you chose to redeem the most unlikely of sinners. God, that uh, your offer of grace is open to us. So God, I pray that today we might be able to walk in faith and know that, Lord, under you, we have a new name. We are no longer what we did, but we are defined by what you have done. And we thank you for that, God. We thank you for your work on the cross. And we pray, God, just as Rahab put out that red rope from her window, God, that those that are close to us, maybe you're thinking of their names right now, just just maybe say their names in your head right now. Those of you that, that know that there's people around you that need to be saved. God, we pray for these people right now. God, we pray for opportunities to share you, to rescue them from the destruction to come. God, thank you that you save and you redeem and you restore. God, would you do it? Would you do it again? Would you do it through us? As you keep on praying today, maybe you, like Rahab, want to be changed. Maybe you want to move from the house of shame to the hall of fame. Maybe you want to move from the night to the light. Maybe from prostitute to princess or whatever you call it. From the red light to the red rope. You know that is possible all through the blood of Jesus. So that is, if that is you and you know Jesus and you decided, Lord, I, I, I know you and I believe in you and I want to follow you, then I want to just ask you to demonstrate your faith right now. Just raise up your hand and say, Lord Jesus, I want to know you. If you want to follow Jesus today, just let me know. Let me know. I want to lead you in a prayer. Anybody here? Anybody here want to just express their faith? Yeah, praise God. I see you. I see you right now. Anybody else? Yeah. Amen. If you're here today and you believe and you want to demonstrate your faith in Jesus, just, just pray these words with me. It's not the prayer that saves you, but it's belief in your heart. Say this with your hand raised out and outstretched to Jesus. Jesus, I need you. I can't save myself. I repent of and turn from my sin. And I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again. I believe that you alone are the way, the truth, and the life. Would you save me? I give you all of me today and declare from this moment that I am yours and you are mine. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and making me new. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God for those born into his family.